Good morning, Pastor Brad from Emmanuel Baptist Church. If you are watching this, it means you are out of town or you are not ready yet to come. We understand that. We're all still coping with the virus and trying to figure out the safest way to continue moving forward. We miss you if you're not with us today. This is our first Sunday back at the church. Uh, obviously, you can still get us online. We're going to be meeting at 10 o'clock on YouTube. Information is right here. And our services are at 930. So we want to encourage you to, to come, to join us if you can when you're able. You, you just be welcome here to Emmanuel. And I'm looking forward to seeing you and being back together. And if you're new and have never been to Emmanuel, we're looking forward to uh, meeting you and becoming acquainted. Uh, we would love to have uh, just ministry into your life. We are in the Gospel of John. I'm excited about that. We're in chapter 16. We're in the final discourse. Jesus is about to go to the cross, and he lovingly is ministering to his disciples. You know, love just is defining everything that he's doing. He's teaching the disciples uh, with patience. He's walking them through moments when they simply just don't understand. He knows what's about to come. He's preparing them for that. He's equipping them for that. He's equipping them beyond those moments into the future. Uh, what a great Savior. We are in chapter 16, just before chapter 17, where we really kind of move into the almost the Holy of Holies as Jesus prays. One of the most special chapters in all of Scripture. They are all so significant and so important, but so rare to be able to see the Lord pray like we're about to see. Here in, here in this chapter... He is still finalizing his teaching to his disciples. We pick it up in verse 25 of chapter 16, and this is what we see. Jesus says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God I came from the father and have come into the world and now I am leaving the world and going to the father his disciples said ah now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you this is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? This morning, we just face real challenges. Uh, the virus is still there around us. Uh, we've just had upheaval in our culture this week. So much is going on. And then just in our own lives, we face the challenges that are just a part of our unique, are unique to us, are unique to what you're walking through, because everybody who's listening has a story of what God is doing or trying to do in your life. This morning, as we look at this passage, we just encounter this reality that God wants us to be an overcomer. He promises to help us, a child of God, be overcomers in our life. He's going to show us here in this passage how we can be overcomers. It is so significant to our walk in the Lord. I'm looking forward to uh, to what we have here. Let's pray. Father, we just, we just ask that you would... Use your spirit to, to guide our words. May the words of life from these pages leap into our hearts and, uh, and, and touch us where we need to be changed and transformed, encouraged and motivated. Lord, we just pray that you would do a work this morning that only you can do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How to be an overcomer. Overcomer is just a challenge. When we think of that word, we think of the terminology, we think of just the, the, the process of overcoming, it conjures up uh, images of a struggle, of a battle, of repeated efforts to try to gain victory, of failure, you know, and this is very personal. Uh, this, this emphasis for all of us look into our own lives and we see the continuing need to be overcoming in our life. I have seen God help me overcome in many ways in my life but I am still in need of being a, an overcomer every day. And so are you. That'll never change and that'll never end until we're with the Lord in glory. And he ultimately and finally transforms our bodies from, from one that is that has the flesh of sin in us to a, a body that's finally fully transformed and renewed by the grace and transforming power of God. Until then, we are called to be overcomers. 
So how do we do that? Well, there's three things that I want to highlight this morning from the passage that I think are helpful to us. I, I want to be an encouragement to you because I know you struggle. I know my struggles. I know God has been, been faithful and been victorious. And so we want to, we want to harness, harness those things and bring it to the Word of God. If we're going to be an overcomer, then the first thing that we simply see here is this, is that an overcomer is in relationship. An overcomer is in relationship with God. It flows from knowing God, from having a relationship with God. We pick that up in these verses right here. What we acknowledge is this, Lord, I belong to you. When I, when I reflect on that relationship, I reflect on that reality. I am organically connected to Jesus Christ, the vine and the branches. He is working in me. He's working through me. I am, a, I am a part of the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. I belong to him. He cares for me. And so he speaks into my life here. And, and it reminds me that I have hope. It reminds us that we have hope today. We have hope right now. We have hope for the challenges today. Because you know what? The things that we are called to overcome aren't just out there. They're often taking place right here in our own heart. Maybe as you're listening right now, there's a battle going on in your heart between you and the Lord about something in your life. Encouragement is God's there to help us. It's relationship. Verse 25 and 29, I have said these things to you. He says, it's been in figures of speech. They're not ready for everything that he's going to share. It's not that he can't communicate. He needs to learn communication 101 again. He's vague. It's none of those things. He is carefully giving to them what they can handle in the moment and will communicate to them when the time is right. He's using figures of speech with them. He uses parables with, with the crowds in general. He will soon use plain speech even in this passage. But the key here is this. When I'm in relationship, I'm called to, to be a listener. God I, God, I will listen to you. I want to listen to your heart. I want to know what your word has to say. I want to know what you... What your will is into my life. What is it you would have me to do? God, I want to be a listener. We're so quick to talk over other people, and we're so quick to talk over God. We're so quick to be thinking about what our response is going to be when we're in conversation with someone. And we are called to slow down and to, and to, and to be listeners. We're called to, to hear the, the, the small voice of God. That as we saw last week, it thunders into our life through the Holy Spirit and into every crevice in our life. We're called to be listeners. That is relationship. We see here in verse 26, and in that day you will ask in my name. In relationship, we are called to pray. As we listen to God, we are also given the, the privilege, the honor to talk with God, to talk with God in prayer, to bring our needs before the Lord, to bring our, our praise before the Lord, to bring supplication before the Lord, to adore Him, to worship Him in prayer. That is relationship, listening to His heart so that it may come into my life, talking to him in prayer he says here in verse uh, in verse 26 i do not say to you that i will ask the father on your behalf in prayer for the father himself loves you jesus isn't saying here he's not setting aside his role as mediator on our behalf he's not setting aside the ministry of the holy spirit who takes our utterings and our groanings that we can't form into words and, and lay them before the father he's not setting aside any of those things what he's showing here through John is this. Our relationship is so special that I am loved not only by Jesus Christ and by the Spirit who lives in me, I am loved by my Heavenly Father. He loves me personally, deeply, intimately. Jesus communicates that here. My Father, your Father, loves you this morning. Jesus began his discourse, final discourse, and having loved them, he loved them to the end. The love of God is, is being uh, poured into our life in relationship through the Spirit of God, the Son of God, and God the Father. He's emphasizing that. We belong to Him. That is relationship. He loves us so much. Another element of relationship here is, is also found in verse, in verse 27. The Father loves you because you have loved me. And I do love you. I do love you, Lord. I do love you this morning. Can you say that? Lord, I love you this morning. I love you. That's relationship. Our relationship is to be defined by that love, which he's talked about so much in this text. He continues and he says in verse 27, And you have believed that I came from God. 
I came from the Father. I have come into this world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. John 14, I'm going to, back to the Father. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back someday. The reality here is this. The disciples affirm, Jesus affirms here, you have believed. He is stating the reality of their faith in Christ, their saving faith in Jesus Christ. Judas has left. Unbeliever. The remaining disciples are there. Believers in Christ. Trusting Him. Believing Him. In fact, in verse 30, and, and we believe that you came from God. It's so plain now. Figurative to now plain. It's so plain who you are. It's so clear who you are. We believe. And, and Jesus says, do you believe now? Now you believe? Are you, are you sure? He's not questioning their salvation faith. He's questioning the application of their faith. He's questioning the implementation of that faith into their life. He's questioning, are they ready to implement that faith and what's about to come? That's what he's questioning here. It's almost uh, an, 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 an incredulous, an, 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 you know, he's, he's amazed here. And he speaks to them, and he's, he's saying by making that comment, you don't know what you're saying yet. Yes, you believe, and yes, you have affirmed faith in me, and that is the most significant thing, but you don't know what's about to come. And your affirmation of faith isn't merited in, in the action that's about to come into, into from your life. He knows our hearts, but it's relationship here. All of this... We overcome because we have a relationship with Christ. We overcome because we're connected to Christ. It is the relationship we have with Christ that enables us to be overcomers. We're going to see that. To be overcomers then takes another step. They've just proclaimed here their, their faith, their belief. We do believe. Jesus puts that on the table and says, Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure your faith is ready to be implemented? Are you sure you're ready to obey? Are you sure that you're ready to stand? See, one of the things that's real is, is if we're going to be overcomers, we have to recognize our, our vulnerability. We have to recognize our, our weakness. Uh, in verse 31, there, there's, there's a confidence that they proclaim. There's an affirmation that they proclaim. We're yours. We believe you. We're standing. There's an assurance that they have. Is it, is it an assurance that is that is based upon Christ, or is it an assurance that is based upon their own ability to stand? Zechariah makes a prophecy, chapter 13, verse 7, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus says this. He shows his fulfillment here in this text. Matthew 26, Jesus said to the disciples, You will all fall away. Because of me this night. It is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And they all left him and they fled. The weight of what they're about to encounter is too much. The, bird, the, the weight of the trial, the tribulation, it's more than they can bear. What's about to be poured on their shoulders is more than they can handle. Their confidence is misplaced. We believe but that affirmation verbally is not going to be followed through by the affirmation from their heart. It is a misplaced confidence. It is a verbal confidence. It is not a life confidence. You know, when I was a uh, junior high or early high school, I went to visit my uncle Charlie in Michigan. And uh, he's a hard worker. And he was working on a barn just, just outside of Toledo in Michigan, a really big, tall barn. And I wanted to help. And so I don't know how this all worked. I forget a lot of the details. But... I got to that barn and I knew I'd be have to work. Charlie was a worker, and if you if you hung out, if you hung out with Charlie when he worked, he was going to make you work, and, and that's what I wanted to do. And so I got there, and he was up on the roof, and and he was shingling the, the roof, and he says, "You can bring uh, shingles up on the roof." I said, "Okay, I can do that." And I was a little tentative about that, but I was also confident. I was eager. I wanted to I wanted to uh, impress him. I wanted I wanted to work hard. That was important to me. And so I put a bundle of shingles on my shoulder, and I started up that ladder. Well, I'm not afraid of heights, but I also don't like heights. 
And I started up that ladder and it got higher and it got higher and it got higher. And I said it was a tall barn. I've seen it multiple times through the years. And, uh, and, I, and I got up higher and higher and, that, and those shingles got heavier and heavier and heavier on my shoulder. And I got to the top there and that lip where you just, you got to get it up onto the bill. I couldn't, I couldn't get it up. I, it was too heavy and I was, and I was too tentative because of the height to, to really throw my weight behind it. And I said, Charlie, I need help. And, and he helped get those shingles off of my shoulder. And, and uh, you know, he didn't shoot me out or anything, and he just, he just helped. And I don't remember a lot of what else, but I know we worked together, and, uh, and that was a delight. But, but it just reminds me, we often get ourselves in situations where we think we can do it. We get in over our heads, and then we find out we can't do it on our own. We walk the walk of faith, but when we walk it by ourselves and not in faith and not, not by the Spirit of God, we find ourselves encountering situations where we just can't do it. Math is my toughest subject. You all know that. When I was in junior high, high school, I'd sit in a math class and I'd be, I'd be lost. And I'd listen and I'd listen and I'd listen. And finally, finally, as the teacher talked and taught, I'd finally get a concept. I can do this. I can do this. Man, I understand. And I'd leave that class and I'd go home and, and do homework or study for a test. And all of a sudden, that would just go out the window. And, and it was lost to me. And it was, I was just, I felt hopeless. I felt uh, unable. Um, my confidence had been just, it just evaporated. The disciples are right here. That's where they're at. And so to overcome, if you and I are going to be overcomers, we have to acknowledge we are weak. We have to acknowledge the reality that we need the Lord. Lord, I need you. I, can't, I cannot overcome the spiritual battles in my life unless you are there to enable me. I can't do it myself. It doesn't matter how hard I try, whether I pull my bootstraps up or not. I can't do it myself. Lord, I need you you see the danger is very real look here at at, uh, at verse 32 again behold the hour is coming and indeed it has come the the time of reckoning has come the hour for christ has come it is now the hour the hour of his going to the cross of standing in our place of he who knew no sin becoming sin for us but it is also the hour of testing for these disciples. And with Jesus dying on the cross, the disciples are left alone. It is now their hour. What will they do? How will they respond? How will they respond? That's the key. Well, verse 32 tells us, and you will be scattered each to his own home. The danger is so real. And we often react you know, when I'm in the Spirit of God, my response is so very different. But when I'm not in the Spirit of God, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to respond on my own and in my own ability, in my own power, I'm going to react. The disciples reacted when Jesus died. And they didn't come together and weep and cry and, and lament together. They didn't come together to give strength to one another. They didn't come together to, to bring bond and... and, and to find that, that strength in one another, they fled. And, and they went off by themselves. And the word, the word home here is not, is not necessarily in the translation. It's, it's implied. It could be they left not only to their own homes. They, left, they went into their own world. They went into their own thoughts. They, they went to themselves. And, and, they, and they were just by themselves. And, and the thoughts of everything that had just happened just brought them down. You know, Peter, when he denied the Lord three times this night, uh, he was by himself. The other disciples weren't there to give him strength. They weren't there to help him uh, stay strong and to avoid that, that sin of, of, of uh, denying Christ. They fled. You know, when we, danger is so real in our life, and we never know when it's going to come. Jesus knew it was, it was going to happen that night. They didn't, they didn't know the intensity. They didn't know what was going to happen, but Jesus did. He knows in our life. We're so vulnerable. He knows today there's a trap right there for us. That's why we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lord, lead me around so that, so that I can, don't lead me where I can't handle. But when I fail, it's not God's fault. It's, it's mine. God gives us everything we need for life and godliness. He gives us everything that we need to succeed, to overcome. The danger, the danger is real in our life, in my life, and in yours. And it may hit us when we least expect it. We've got to be ready by faith. We've got to know we're weak and rest on the power of God.
And in danger, we just often make decisions that are so destructive. And it says here in verse 32, and, and you'll leave me. He says, I'm not alone. But he says, this is what you're going to do. You're going to leave me. Often when we fight battles on our own, we, we, mis, we misunderstand the dangers. And it hits us between the eyes. And it knocks us down. And we react. And our reactions are not Christ reactions. Our reactions are not spirit-filled reactions. Our reactions are not biblically-based reactions. They're, they're reactions of the flesh. They're reactions of our, our nature. And, and they just make things worse. And they, and they just escalate things. And they just... They don't, they don't resolve anything. They take us deeper into, into this battle, into this turmoil, into this defeat. And we, and we often abandon principles that we are standing on. We ab abandon principles of the Word of God that we have proclaimed before other believers and people in our life. I'm standing on this and I believe this because it hasn't been applied into my life. And we abandon what is right and we follow our own heart. And we, we abandon, we abandon, and we run. We're, da we're weak. There's a, there's a hymn that was written that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful hymn. I need thee every, every hour. And Annie Hawks wrote this, 1872. She says it was, a, it was a beautiful, it was a bright June day. She goes, I became so filled with the sense of the nearness of my master that I began to wonder how, how anyone could live without him, in either joy or pain. And suddenly these words flashed into my mind, I need thee every hour. And I sat down and I wrote, I read out these, these words furiously, and they, and they came to me. And a few months later, Dr. Lowry composed the music, the tune that would need it, and wrote that, that final refrain. And she goes, later on in my life, I suffered a great loss. And those words had had deep meaning into my own life. When I had given it out to others and it had been used of God as a ministry to others, when I had had the privilege of seeing God use the words of that song in the lives of others, I now saw its power in my own life. I need thee. God, I need you every hour. That's the reality of this. To be an overcomer, I have to realize that. I have to understand that. Matt Maurer wrote, Lord, I need you. Um, he gives a testimony and he says, the songs that we write come out of the legacy of the old songs. And in this testimony, specifically out of this song, Lord, I Need Thee, came this particular song here that he wrote. He says, he says we have a need love. It comes out of our point of need. We, we never outgrow needing the Lord. We never outgrow our need. We need the Lord, and He loves us in our need. Every day, all the time, and He meets us in our need, and we love Him. We love Him from the depths of our heart because... He doesn't give up on us. He meets us in our need. And he wrote this song, and he says, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. Well, we can relate to that, can't we? When I cannot stand, I fall on you. And then we see as we continue in the passage, overcoming, it's, it's an overcomer is motivated. What are we motivated by? Well, we're motivated by the Word of God. We're motivated by that relationship. We're motivated by the dangers that, we're, that we face so, we, so that we're prepared and, and ready and, and, and want to have the victory for the glory of God so that we can be conformed to the image of God. We can be more like Him. Verse 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says this, when we are overcomers, it's because we've come to this, this commitment in our life. Lord, I'm going to live for you. God, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live for you. Verse 33 reminds us, if I'm going to do that, there's things that are going to be longings and desires in my life. Right now, this is your desire. This is your longing. It's the peace of God. He reminds us here that in me, you have peace. Peace. The peace with God that starts at the cross. It starts when we receive Christ. And the peace of God, that's the peace that I experience when I'm walking with the Lord. When there's nothing between me and God. When I keep a short account, when I have a clear conscience, when I'm in fellowship with God. That peace is not, is not based on performance. 
God desires that I, that I obey Him, that I follow through, that I'm faithful, that I'm all these things, but the peace of God that He gives me, it's not based on my performance, because my performance can never equal the holiness of God. It is based on relationship and on what I have in Christ and who I am in Jesus Christ. And He gives me peace. It comes from the Lord alone. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. He says, this peace is from Christ. It's from God. It's not from this world. You know, the world can, can provide many things. The world can, can provide uh, uh, counseling into our life, and the world can provide uh, therapy into our life. The world, the world can, can give us ways to cope with, with challenges and situations in our life. The world can distract us from, from the challenges of life that we're facing. The, the world can surround us with friends. The world, the world can fill, fill my time and my days with activity, things to do. The world can make me feel better about myself. The world will tell me, you're all right. The world will tell you to follow your heart. The world will tell you to be true to yourself. But the world, the world cannot give you peace. The world cannot give you peace. Not the peace of God. The world will not, and the world cannot, and the world does not value drawing you close to Christ. That is the opposite of what the world wants for you. The world wants you to be true to yourself. God wants you to be true to Him. The peace of God comes from that. It is from Christ alone. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will act as a guard. It is a sentinel in my life. It, is, it, is, it stands guard over my life and my heart. Those battles that we face, that we need to overcome, we all know those battles start in the heart. They start in the mind. I'm battling in my mind about whether I should or shouldn't. It happens all the time. And the peace of God acts as a guard. If the disciples that night had prayed with the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'm not going to judge him, because if I was there, I would have failed too. Not one of them disciples succeeded that night. And I would have been just like them. So would have you. But they know, and you know, and I know, if they would have prayed and laid, laid the unknown but the desperate challenges that they knew lay, to, lay ahead of them, if they had laid that before the Lord in prayer, what a difference that might have made in their life that very evening for Peter and for the others. They would have been better prepared. Peace ultimately is a choice. You keep him, God, you keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Peace is a choice. It's a result of a fixed mind. My mind is fixed on you. It's a re result of a mind that's being trained by the word of God, being trained to respond biblically. It is a result of a mind that, that properly is properly used, that is thinking on things that are, that are uh, pleasing to the Lord, that are thinking on things and responses and, and goals and passions and mission and thinking on, on uh, ways to respond to trials in a way that are biblical and pleasing to the Lord is an engaged mind. It is, a, it is a mind that is aware of the surroundings and aware of the presence of Christ. And in, that, and in that reality, there is the peace of God to the child of God who is aware of His presence. And so I say, I'm going to live for you. The desire of my heart is the peace of God. The desire of my heart is to pursue Christ. You know, we see here, look at the distinction in verse 33. Jesus says, in me you have peace. And in the world you have tribulation. He shows us the battleground. He shows us the distinction. 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life isn't from the Father, but it's from the world. And he shows us this. It takes us back to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, when they sinned and fell into sin. He looked at that fruit and said it was good for food and it was del delightful to the eyes and it, it was desired to make one wise. And they had the same battles then that Peter speaks of, that John speaks of here. To overcome, realize it, it, we have to realize that we're, we're fighting an enemy that is, that is the system of this world. Is the, it is the worldview of, of, of this world that Satan has domination over for a time. It is, it is the, the flesh of my nature that, I, that I'm fighting, that battle, that inward battle. And those desires are within. It is an inward battle. 
and I have to make a choice. Will I follow after my heart? Will I follow after what the world lays before me or will I follow Christ? Jesus says, in me you have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation. The world's going to cause trouble. The world's going to make life difficult. Jesus says, I'm here to walk you through that. I'm here to give you peace. I'm here to help you overcome. But we have to make a choice. And ultimately, you, just, you and I, we simply have to desire, Lord, I, I want to be an overcomer. I want victory. Corey Ten Boom, a dear lady who, who suffered terribly in her early years. She was a, a prisoner of war in Germany under Nazi Germany, World War II. She wrote uh, the book that many of you know and have read multiple times, probably The Hiding Place, seen the movie. She says these words. I want to read them to you. She says, this is how I handled my situation. I want to paraphrase what she wrote. I looked around and I was distressed. Is that you? You look at our culture. Is that what we see? We look around us and we're just, we're distressed by everything that we see. She said, I looked, she says, I looked within and, and I was depressed. That's the reality often. We look deep into our heart and we're quiet and we're in bed and it's just us and God and we're just in solitude and we, we know the failures that have been true in our life and we know the, the sin that's in our life and, and we know the, the need to be overcomers and we know that God is calling us to follow after Him and yet we've said no and we just that battle and that struggle that's in your heart and in mine. And she says, I looked within and, and I was depressed. But then I looked at Jesus and I found rest. That's what she writes. That was a difference maker for her there and then. She says, I kept, she says, I kept kneeling down and I kept looking up. I saw my life from the position of the victory of Jesus Christ over my problems, over my situation, that he is willing to make us more than conquerors. How does he do that? How do we overcome? Just, just some, some quick words of encouragement to you. How do we do that? Romans 3 we just realize and we just bask and, and we operate under this reality that we're loved. In all things, in all these things, these tribulations, we are more than conquerors through him who, who loved us. The first step of victory is just to be reminded you're not alone. God loves you. You're his child. He's there to help you. 1 John 5, 4 reminds us that we can trust him. We came to the Lord in faith. We walk by faith. We were born of God. We overcome we have victory through faith. We overcome by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. We trust Him. We encounter the challenge. We encounter the difficulty. We encounter the sin in our own life. We look at our sin. We, we may feel, I don't want to give that up. But we look at it through the eyes of Christ and we say, I'm willing to give that up. I'm willing to let that go because that's not your heart, Lord. I want, I want to be conformed to you. I want to be like you. I like what, I've, what I'm involved in, but I'm giving it up. Lord, give me the power. Give me the ability. In faith, I trust you. I believe that it's better to let go than to hang on. I believe it's better to follow you in this situation than to do it my own way. I trust you. God, I believe you. That's a key. That's a step. Another is to know that you're not alone. You have power. 1 John 4, 4, little children, you're from God, and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We have power that is divine, that is supernatural. Right now, if you're a child of God, the Spirit of God is in your heart right now, this morning. Jesus Christ is in your heart. His character is being poured into your life through the Spirit of God, through His Word. He calls us here little children because we are, in, in, in relation to God, we are always children always needing to learn to grow and we have we're so far from where we need to be but you know what he says i've given you everything that you need for life and for godliness power 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 you need to know that faithfulness matters the lamb will conquer he is the lord of lords he's the king of kings those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. We're called to be faithful. He's called us. He's chosen us for a specific task. He wants to use you. It is victories in your life that will reflect that God is using you. He uses you through bringing victories. He uses you through transformation. He uses you through changing your life 
your will and your passion. And our choices, our choices matter. Joshua 24, 15, he says, you know what? In that generation and today, in, in our generation today, in your life and mine, we have to make a choice. Who is it we're going to serve? Who are we going to serve today? We're called to make a choice. Joshua said here, are you going to serve the gods of your ancestors? Or are you going to serve the gods of the land that you're living in? Are you going to be... Your family is a certain way. We all have families. Your family operates this way. Your family believes this way. You know, it's the hardest often to take a stand for Christ in the family. Well, this is who my family is. If I take a stand, my family's not going to like it. My family's going to turn against me. My family's going to make it tough. I can't do that. That's how my family is. This is what we believe. He's calling the believers here to separate from their families and to turn to God. Not to follow the faith of their ancestors, the ways of their ancestors, because the ways of their ancestors was, was their own way, not God's way. And in the land that we're living, the culture around us, often we lose battles because we embrace. We embrace everything that the culture shows us. We believe it. Jesus says, you know, we have to let those values go. We have to replace those values by following after Christ and to serve the Lord. And here's the beautiful thing, Galatians 5.1. Christ has set us free for freedom, for the purpose of freedom. Christ has set us free. And so we're to stand and not submit again. He's saved us so that we can be free. You're free. You're free. You are free to choose. You are free to choose victory. You're free to choose holiness and righteousness. You're free to overcome. Before I met Christ, we were dead in sins. We couldn't overcome the bondage of sin. We had no power to overthrow sin in our life. Because Jesus lives within us through the Spirit of God, we are the temple of God. We have the freedom to say no, to cast out sin, to overwhelm the bondage of sin and to break the chains of sin. We have the power in Christ to be victorious. That's your power this morning. Right now, you can win the battle in Christ. John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We're overcomers because we're in relationship with Christ. Trust you are this morning. We're overcomers because we are real, we're authentic about our weakness, our vulnerability. We're overcomers because we're motivated, we're empowered biblically by God. We're motivated by God's purpose and mission in our life. We're, we're motivated by His promises of enablement and ability in our life. We're overcomers because he said we can be overcomers. He promises that. That's been my story. God has helped me to be an overcomer. But I still have more overcoming to do. How about you? Would you pray? Would you talk to the Lord? Would you say, Lord, I release control of the thing that is, that is plaguing me in my personal life. Lord, I, I, I give to you the challenge in the few, uh, that I'm facing. I give you the anxiety, the stress, the the trial that's in front of me. God, help me to be an overcomer in this. Help me to see it through your eyes. Settle my heart and settle my soul. Give me the peace, the power, the enablement to walk through in victory, to respond in a way that is victorious, that brings glory to you, honor to you. I'd encourage you to listen to this song as we, as we finish up, Living Hope. It's a reminder to us of the, of the hope that we have in Christ that he, Christ has set us free, that he's broken every chain in our life. And that song just reinforced the truth of what the passage shows to us. Listen to it. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to help you to be an overcomer. Give to him the battles and challenges that you face. Lord, our prayer is that we would just settle in our hearts those battles. Give them to you. Lord, the challenges, the trials, the testing, the tribulation, the temptations that are in front of us, the dangers that might be right around the corner that, that we're not even aware of might be right there today or tomorrow. God, may we develop our faith today, right now, this moment. May we stand in you. May we yield to you. May we listen to your voice. May you draw us deeply into your word and into relationship. May you surround us with your love and your grace. God, enable us to be prepared and ready for the fight that surely is coming. And may we fight in a manner that brings honor and glory to you, results in victory, transformation, reveals that we are conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to come when you're ready and able. We look forward to seeing you here at Emmanuel.
Good night.